So welcome, and today it's my pleasure to be introducing Kayoko Dan, a wonderful conductor, music director with the Chattanooga Symphony and Orchestra since 2011, I believe. Uh, previously, uh, assistant conductor of the Phoenix Symphony. Kayoko, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. So um, I'm going to start with just a simple question about your background, your upbringing. Where did you grow up? How was your beginning with music? How did you decide to become a conductor? Yeah, well, I was born in Japan. Um, and my dad was a banker in Japan. So what that means is every couple of years we moved. Um, so my first eight years, I, was, I lived in three different places. Um, and I always feel like music was like a glue that kept me together through the move. Um, myself being a classic introvert, it took a while for me to warm up to people and having music, you know, is a way to like build a community or be part of a community and make friends immediately. So, uh, you know, I was always involved in music classes since I was tiny. Um, and I did actually take up flute when I was in middle school and that's where I decided that I was going to be a uh, band director. So I went to UT Austin thinking that I will become a high school marching band director because I had such a wonderful um, public school teachers. Um, and then, you know, I fell in love with orchestra music along the way and decided that that's where I wanted to be. Um, instead of doing high school band, I wanted to become an orchestra teacher. So that's why I got my master's and my doctorate at Arizona State University, thinking that I will teach um, college if I'm lucky. And um, my last year in doctorate, my teacher, Tim Russell, who is the conductor of the Ballet Arizona, gave me an opportunity to be part of the Nutcracker production. So that opened up a whole new world of professional conducting. So that's, that's how it got started. Wonderful. So fascinating story. And uh, so when did you move from Japan to the US? How was was it for college or before then or? It was before I was eight. So my dad, it was through my dad's work. So I grew up uh, mostly in, in Texas, Houston. So so you've been you've been here for quite a while. Yeah. So my accent is Texas, I guess. <laughs> How fascinating. <laughs> so um, you have, uh, I mean, the next question I, I want to ask you is uh, along the way of that path of searching and, and you know, feel, uh, luckily that you felt very free to try and even though you had an initial idea of a band, then you had an opportunity to do an orchestra and you transitioned to that. Did you ever feel any, I mean, I've been obviously following the media articles and things about uh, biases against female conductors and this should should be already old and hopefully never discussed again but it's still relatively recent and at some point you know it's been only a few years that Marin also was the first uh, female conductor to ever conduct the proms and so forth so you might have been asked a few times I suppose whether you ever felt discriminated against for being a woman or for being Asian or anything like this sort in the profession Right, that's a really good question. And myself being the first female conductor of the Chattanooga Symphony, I was asked that question a lot. And at first, you know, I was confused when people asked me, how does it feel to be a female conductor? Like, well, I don't know how to be, you know, a male conductor. So I don't have a reference point. But I feel lucky that I never felt the discrimination um, because of my gender. And I always... It, um, assumed if I didn't win a job, it's because of my ability or the fact that there was no chemistry between the conductor, myself and the orchestra, because that's a big deal, right? You can go to one orchestra and you feel like you're making music with old friends. Um, and then you go to another orchestra and you feel like you're trying to drag a 500 pound boulder behind you and it's just not connecting and it's no one's fault. It's just, there's no chemistry like friendship. So um, I never felt like there wasn't a discrimination and I always felt more of a uh, support from the people around me, uh, whether it's because I'm a female or just the, for me, you know, so my mentors, my teachers and Phoenix Symphony musicians have all been super supportive. Wonderful, wonderful. And so talking about this chemistry that you described, 
In your view, what are some of the most important qualities that an orchestra conductor needs to have? I think for me, it's the ability to communicate and knowing that the communication is not, is not a one-way street. So I communicate, I watch their reaction and I respond. So it's, it's like chamber music. I, I say something and I look at them, make sure that they get it. And you can tell if they're, it's like, what did you just say? That metaphor did not make any sense. And then, you know, I try to say it differently. Um, some people like it super straightforward short, long, softer, right? And some people like more elaborate expressions um, and then just kind of knowing that and feel, getting a feel for it and adjusting to the orchestra as I rehearse, I think is very important. Wonderful. And talking about this, how do you develop trust with an orchestra and what are those differences you might encounter um, in different situations, like working with your own orchestra as music director versus going and traveling the world as a guest conductor? How, how do you build this relationship of trust? I think trust, um, I think you have to trust them first before you earn trust and trust that these people can play their instrument better than I can play their instruments, for example. And everyone has their tasks. It's their job to prepare the music and play their instrument at the, at the you know, best possible way. And my job is to do the conduct and rehearse. So I think just having the separation of tasks and knowing what their task is and my task is and trusting that they do their job so I can do my job, um, I think is important. Sometimes I've been criticized that I, you know, I don't interfere with their preparation as much or I don't get upset, right? When people I, I do get upset, but I don't yell <laughs> when people are not prepared because it's, that's not my job, right? I mean, I say that's not acceptable, but I can't go into their house and tell them to practice, uh, things like that. So I think overall, if you set a standard and trust that they do their job, so it, I think you just have to trust first. Wonderful. So you're uh, in, in many ways an, an unusual case because you're experienced uh, with the symphony world, the opera and the ballet. Uh, somehow in, in the US, it seems to be quite separated. There are people who do just yeah. one or the other, but in your case, you do all three. So what are some of those differences you see between working as a ballet conductor or an opera conductor or with the symphony, <laughs> different kinds of collaborations? What are some some differences you would point out? For me, I'm least experienced in opera, um, so I can't really speak much about it. Um, my, my experience in opera is not as extensive as a symphonic um, world. But with symphony, it, there's no external things that you have to deal with. So it's just me and orchestra and the music. So I think it's a little simpler in a way. Um, and which means that that, mean, that means I have to be extra prepared for that, um, for, for rehearsals and of course, you know, knowing what I want out of the music. But for ballet, tempo is set, right? Um, flow of the music is set. So you're facilitating. So you're basically making sure that you are facilitating what's happening on the stage and um, in the pit. And most of the time it's very consistent from one night to another. And I think opera is a little different. Um, you know, people, you know, singers, um, their, their expression might change from one night to another. They might not be feeling well because their body is their instrument and it might be a little bit different. And I've had cases where a singer totally skipped some lines and like, oh, <laughs> that doesn't happen in ballet that I know of. Um, but those challenges to me are kind of fun to like all of a sudden you're like put in a spot to fix it right so that's like exciting to me and for those people who are not the familiar so much with the world of ballet uh which you mentioned i think is crucial the idea that the tempo is fixed and somehow you are uh second in command and the choreographer is really in charge and telling you okay this dancer needs exactly this tempo and there is not much leeway right yeah. Yeah, and with the Ballet Arizona, my teacher, Tim Russell, is a very generous conductor. So he adjusts tempo to, to, the, 
to the main role. So, I, you know, for Nutcracker, there were like eight rotations of dancers. So every day I would check who's, you know, the sugar plum. All right, Ginger, she spins really fast. So it had to be a little bit faster or, you know, Giselle, she's taller. So I had to be a little bit slower. Um, and so that was fun every night, it kept me on my toes. Definitely, definitely. Um, and that's possibly one of the similarities with the opera world where you have more than one cast and you have to adjust tempo or where to breathe or how to phrase it depending on who is on the stage singing that night. Right. <laughs> so next I'd like to ask you a more general kind of question. It's a very short question that can have a very long answer. Um, okay. In your opinion, what is the role of music nowadays? Yeah, you know, that's the answer might have been different a year ago, pre pandemic. Right. <laughs> but I, it's different, but it's the same. I think it's a way for people to connect. Because even through pandemic, people are trying to connect through a cappella apps or, you know, how you play online somehow, TikTok. Um, and, you know, people are creating that connection and people are using music to do that. And, and also, um, I feel like it kind of gives a collective um, space to feel something together. So, you know, people might turn to music for, for healing, right, or celebration. Um, so I think music creates that space, community and connection. And um, talking about the business side of you know running an orchestra or an opera house is there anything you would change uh, in in the world of classical music yeah um we have been talking about this for the last couple months now my my staff um created a um, racial equity committee um since you know tragedy in june um so we've been talking about a lot of equity stuff and not, that's not just racial, but socioeconomic equity and trying to figure out how we can be more equitable um, as an organization that could be a community, different parts of the community or the audience or the, um, the patrons, um, board representation, staff representation and artist representation. So there are a lot of stuff on the table right now trying to, you know, save the world through music, but we are um, aware and of the situation now. And I feel like it truly needs some, I don't know, uh, meditation on it and action to go with it. Definitely. And going back a little bit to your education, your background, your first steps into the profession, who would you say have been your greatest mentors, people who have given you the opportunities, such as the, the Nutcracker you mentioned earlier, any other occasions where you thought, okay, if this hadn't happened, I wouldn't be where I am right now? Yeah, I mean, I had so many teachers that, you know, selflessly um, helped pave the way. Like I said, you know, Tim Russell is like the biggest mentor and he always told me he's like, he, he's the president of Kyoko Dam Fan Club, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I think he is a president of all of his students fan club because he's such a champion to every student that walked through his door and he's just wonderful um but before him um undergraduate conducting teacher um, professor glenn richter he's now retired but at university of texas for undergrad uh, there was only two semesters of conducting but i wanted to learn more and i begged him to create a third semester and i had enough friends who were interested so he made um created a third and fourth semesters, um, which, you know, I said, okay, I want to put together a recital as a project. So, um, you know, he, he was a sponsor, of, uh, he supported us with doing that. And as you know, as a conductor, you need videotapes, right? Proof that you can actually conduct. So um, having that experience was wonderful. But also my flute teacher, Carl, Carl uh, Kraber at UT, uh, when I told him that I was interested in, in conducting, he, uh, so at every end of the lesson, um, after all the etudes and solos and whatever concertos that we have to do, 
um, if we had time left, we would always play duets. And that was, I practiced just so that we can play duets together. Um, and as soon as I told him that I, I was interested in uh, conducting, he started pulling out for different instruments. And so he would have me transpose clarinet part, or he would has, have me read alto clef, tenor clef, um, trumpet part, you know, horn part. So um, I felt like that was super nice and supportive just to develop all those essential yeah. skills that you would need as a conductor. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. So two, two questions kind of interconnected. Who are your favorite composers, which is hard to say, and if you had to choose, you know, the next piece you'd like to conduct, uh, if we were not in the middle of this pandemic, what, what would that be? Well, you know, it's, I always say like whatever I'm studying at the moment is usually my favorite conductor, I mean, conduct composer, um, but I do love studying um, music of Brahms, Brahms symphonies, concertos, um, but I still don't feel 100% comfortable conducting them because I think I'm too in my head, I'm just worried so much about am I executing all the stuff in this music. Um, so there's still a disconnect of my up here and here, I think. Um, but I, I love conducting French music like Rebels um, or Debussy, like La Mer, it's just, the lush sound of it and it could be because I'm a flute player and I grew up playing all the French repertoire and I, it's a language that I resonate with um but you know music like I one of the concerts we had to cancel last season was pictures and exhibition so I think I would love to conduct that one just because I was supposed to <laughs> right and um, what would you say um was the most difficult work you've ever conducted and why? <laughs> well, um, any Stravinsky's music is hard. Um, Between Red and Spring and um, Petrushka. Um, I kind of have a funny story uh, on my expense. I auditioned for a you know, major orchestra one year, which remained nameless. And uh, they had me sight read Petrushka, which I have never studied before. And I probably looked like a hummingbird up there. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew how it went, but I've never studied it. So I couldn't figure how it fit physically. So that was very embarrassing. Um, but as soon as I went home, I ordered it and studied it. But so well, when I... Why yeah. do you think to throw you on a Stravinsky major score like that and say, oh, sight read? Yeah. It was a very eye-opening experience. Um, so I would say that was the hardest thing I had to do, but for the concerts that I actually had, was able to prepare and conduct. Um, some of the stuff that's emotionally hard to conduct is like adagio for strings, uh, maintaining that line, right, intensity, um, is very hard for me, um, and that's and that's the piece that I fell in love with in high school. That's the music that got me into orchestra music. So emotionally, that's such a special music. So it, it's like exhausting <laughs> in a good way. Um, but and I also find Mahler symphonies hard to conduct because of that same issue, the pacing of it and maintaining that in intensity and integrity through the whole one hour of music. And going back to this, I'd, I'd like to ask you once more about the Brahms, because you said you love him so much and you love studying him, but it's also difficult. And uh, is it specifically about the phrasing, the structure, the counterpoint? What What do you find most challenging about Brahms's music? I think it's uh, there's so many details within his music and it, it can be super brainy, right? There's so many little things that you can analyze and you find it's like, oh, I found this, this motive and this and that. Um, same with like Wagner, for example. And you, you find all these little things that are so cool and you wanna bring out and you forget to look, stand back and look at the big picture. And I think getting to that point of, all right, acknowledging they're all there, cool wonderful, beautiful, and then step back and let's 
be the overall director, right, <laughs> um, of this piece. I think it, it takes a while to get to that point. Wonderful. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> indeed. So the next question I want to ask you has to do with the current situation, the pandemic. Uh, we've been for like 10, 11 months with most, mostly with no public concerts, occasionally a little live stream or a remote performance, uh, which is, you know, could be quite decimating for the music world. So uh, what have you been doing? during during the pandemic and what have, have been your main uh, source of inspiration uh, how do you try to find the motivation to keep studying and learning scores what what, what have you been doing um, many things i think like anyone else you, you just went through like 12 steps of i don't know like grief and <laughs> denial and acceptance and all that kind of stuff um, but you know at first it was just survival i, I have a son a uh, five-year-old uh, four at the time like, what do I do? He doesn't have school. I, <laughs> um, so it was just, per and then tornado hit our region and we lost power for a week. So it was just first month was just surviving. Um, and then, you know, things got settled down and we realized that, oh, this thing is not going away anytime soon. What can I do? My skill set as a conductor is absolutely um, not useful at the moment, right? I can wave my arms and nothing will happen. So I, start, I started to transcribe music for smaller ensembles. Cool. So my orchestra has 10 um, core musicians and string quintet and wind quintet. So I tra transcribed about seven or eight pieces for that complement. And I think we're just doing one of them, maybe two later in the season. I didn't really do it thinking that we will perform it soon I just wanted to be useful somehow you know um, be productive so um, we might use it next season when things calm down but you know Mozart 40 uh, some Ravel music uh, Ravel piece and some other random pieces I feel like him <laughs> um, Bruckner him you know things like that I transcribe for for these 10 people, all public domains, so I don't have to ask for permission. Um, and for fun stuff, my sister and I started uh, recording uh, Japanese children's songs. Um, Is she a musician as well, your sister? Uh, she sings. Uh, uh, she, used, she used to live in Japan and do like, write songs, uh, pop, uh, Japanese pop songs, and um, she doesn't do that anymore. Uh, she's back in the US now and you know, so I, I transcribed, uh, I arranged things for like three flutes and a voice and I played all the flute part. And so we have, you know, silly videos of that. So it's just, you know, doing little projects here and there just to entertain ourselves. Wonderful. That's, that's super that you found this different kinds of projects to do with family, to do for your orchestra. And sometimes what probably decompresses this uh, situations is to do something just because and not thinking, oh, yes. we need to do it by a certain date or for a specific project. So it's, it's wonderful you did those arrangements as well. Yeah, and, and doing those transcription uh, was a way to study the scores as well. Because when you're actually inputting these notes and articulations and uh, the, the I'm, I use MuseScore, and I'm, I'm learning a lot by just putting in every single note in there. Wonderful. So uh, the time has come for my final question, which is um, asking you maybe about your advice for young musicians or what would you have told um, yourself if you could just travel back in time and talk to yourself 20 years ago or so, uh, or simply now, how to find inspiration during these difficult times, uh, anything you could um, mention to help any young up and coming musicians would be nice. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know, I feel like young, younger people are so inspirational. <laughs> I think they're, um, they're so creative and they have so many tools at, at their disposal and they're so versatile in it. Like for me to create a blog, I'm like losing my hair. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my God, what happens if I click on this? So, you know, for tech, uh, technology wise, I'm not worried about them at all, but for, um, you know, finding inspirations, I feel like not waiting until you're 100% ready to put yourself out there and just 
um, telling yourself that this is the best you can be at that moment and just get it out there, you know, perform, um, get your art out there, right? And not worry so much about how many likes you get or you're being appraised by people, right? That's not your job, <laughs> right? Your job is to create and, and perform and share and don't worry about the rest. That is wonderful. Kayoko, I want to thank you for your time, your generosity. It's very nice to get to know more about you. So um, I wish you all the best. And, and I thank you very much for joining me for this little interview. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Bye bye now.